you. I apologize to all of you. I uh, was always running across stage and trying to get Congresswoman Dingell uh, out of here because we want her back again. Um, I was also getting this real big urge for a margarita and, uh, you know, guacamole. I don't know if any of you know this great restaurant, but uh, it's yes. not usually. So my, my congratulations to my colleagues on this, this awesome, awesome uh, venue and what we've done to it. First of all, I consider myself in this topic an ally, and I hope you guys will, will be there. But you know, in the, in the forums that I've had the privilege of moderating in the past on women's rights, on civil rights, the thing that kind of haunts me that always comes, so what do we have to do to move the needle so that we don't have to do these? What would put Susanna out of business? What would, wow. what would, what, what would you know, Maria Theresa, in your world, I mean, I, th I think it's important to ask ourselves, are we making progress? Is the needle moving? And when do we know? And Elise, I'm going to start with you for a minute, and we don't have to go on. I just want to have a conversation. Yeah. Consider this the view, but better. <laughs> uh, but but the but yeah, exactly. But I mean, you've been around. I mean, I mean, you you. I mean, maybe you have been I around for twenty. You're yeah. a great twenty-year-old. Uh, but 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 Vital Voices was founded twenty years ago, and you were one of the co-founders. Are you making progress? Are yeah. things better? What would give us the kind of strategic gains in women's rights and society and empowerment and you know getting rid of misogyny? And how do we how do we move? those needles in a more yeah. effective way yeah well I think you know when I look across the world and we work in 184 different countries and territories so we have a really global view and we've seen great strides forward you know from girls education to maternal mortality in these last 20 years but there is one thing maybe you can all guess what it is that has gotten worse for women and that's violence against women, whether mm. it's human trafficking, domestic violence, rape as a weapon of war, culturally harmful practices like child marriage, FGM. Um, what do we need to do to, to make change on this? Because to me, fundamentally, it is about the way in which we value women and girls in this society. And you think about it, violence against women touches all of us. Every single community, country, socioeconomic background, culture, Women are all affected by it. And I feel like we can never rightfully live up to our full potential in our lives, in our work, without feeling protected at home, at work, on the streets. Have you guys been able campuses. to distill why it's getting worse? What are the buttons we're not pushing that is driving more violence against women? I mean, I know you're right. I've seen the data. But yeah. what's driving it? I think for a long time, and honestly, I think 10 years ago, if you would have asked me, how do we make change, I would have said, if we could just get laws on the books, mm. right, saying that domestic violence is a crime. Well, we got laws on the books. Problem is, they didn't get implemented, right? So it's, it is much more about changing culture and changing the way we value women. So what does it take to change culture? Well, it doesn't take the traditional model, right? I mean, it's very much about telling those new stories. Um, and so I think it's going to be out of the box. I think the way in which we address this is going to be certainly targeting men. We've, we started a couple years ago a, um, a big awards program, it's called the Voices of Solidarity, where we honor men who are working to end violence against women. And every year people got all these great men you know, who are doing different things, I'm like, yeah, but it has to be who are ending violence against women, because that's where we really need men in this fight. Suzanne, I want to ask the same question of you. you. You encourage so many women to run. I want to, I want to ask you a um, impossible question, maybe a real question. <laughs> Great. Uh, I was so impressed with the Women's March. It, it, it blew me away, the scale of it. I, I saw some of you there. I have good friends in the audience uh, who were there that day. I've compared it in my mind, and, and, and perhaps I'm making a, a false analogy, and I apologize if I am, but to what's happening on this NFL uh, ah. drama and the, uh, the folks that are, are taking the knee doing something that has been building up over time. The Women's March sort of happened, it was huge, and in my world disappeared. But I'm at, I, what I'm wondering is, and perhaps the wrong impression, but it's an honest one, it's, it's, it's the question of whether or not some of these things are too polite. You know, may, do you need to be, are there lessons from what Colin Kaepernick is doing that women might consider in terms of challenging the misogyny in society, challenging you know, the question of equal rights and fair pay, that, that are you playing it too safe? Wow, I mean, I, I think one of the most audacious things that you can do is to run for office. Hmm. I mean, you know, sort of the most in your face response to an injustice is to say, I'm gonna actually get into that position and I'm gonna change things. And 
I don't agree with you that that, um, that power that was felt, that emotion during the Women's March has dissipated because Good. I, I really right. see, I mean, so I work with young women, Running Start trains young women to run for political office um, starting at the um, age of 15 and all the way up to like 25. And um, they're on fire, Steve. Mm. And, and actually, I think an important thing to note too is that it's not just the, the liberal young women who are on fire, it, it's all of them. They, they see this as a moment in time where we can actually, we can, you know, make change. We can go a few steps further. So I, I see things as very hopeful. And I think that, you know, the fact that there are so many more women running for office this time around, can you I mean, give that's the, the best the, can thing. Can you share the audience the numbers oh my gosh. that you've been well, able to generate? Oh dear, there's probably somebody from Emily's list here who will correct me. Um, I mean, but it's like 18,000 more um, women have at least expressed interest in running for office. And anecdotally, we've never seen so many candidates just from our own ranks, um, mm. you know, come out of our training programs. Yeah. Maria, Maria Teresa wants to jump in because yeah, so she I'm on board of Emily's list. And oh, yeah, last good. year, we were trying to recruit women and roughly about 900 women had thrown their hat into the ring. 900. Mm. As of April, we had over 22,000. Wow. Oh. And so when someone wow. says that there is not energy being harnessed. Uh, that's what we call a tweetable moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's the complete yeah. opposite. Wow. Tweetable right? moment. 22,000. So it's. Now, they've, that means that they've expressed interest. Mm -hmm. But that means, and they are, they are unafraid. Mm -hmm. They are taking a stand. And I do think that the reason, the, what was beautiful about the Women's March is that the Women's March was a culmination of 10 years of marching. And what I mean by that is that in 2006, young immigrants took to the streets to march for immigrant rights. And, and it was the largest of civil rights movement of our time at that point. Two million people took to the streets. Then we saw Occupy Wall Street. After Occupy Wall Street, we saw folks march for equal marriage, for choice, to march against the war. It culminated in Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And then we saw all these folks coming saying, this is the America we want to march for. This is the future. And what was beautiful about the Women's March was, yes, I marched here in Washington. What was beautiful is that deep red states came out to the streets. Right. Oh, yeah. And that was what was special, is that it was a reminding that this is who we are with our American values. This is what is bringing us together. I think it's, that's what brought us courage to march at the airports for the Muslim mm. band. And for many, I think for many athletes, that's what's giving them courage to now take the knee. But it wasn't no just longer. an American phenomenon. No, but All that, around no, the world. No, it was solidarity was, for what just happened in this yeah. country. Like I, I actually, I, I, told, and I think it was, if anything, for the world, it was almost like a payback of, this is every time you've stood next to us, we're standing firmly with you now. And we have to hold on to the fact that we have been the shining light of leadership in this world. And right now what we're happening, and this is, you know, this is your wheelhouse, we're rescinding that leadership. Right. without challenge, and that doesn't make any sense. You know, I, I guess, Natalie, when I, when I think about this and I'm trying to think about game-changing responses, you're dealing, you, you help organize Millennial Week. Right. You were a biochemist in the cancer arena. Uh, <laughs> you were already a leader. Why did you walk away from that uh, to begin animating and moving? Or did you walk away? <laughs> are, you still a, are, you, are, are you still a cancer biologist at night? And a, and a <laughs> Once that, always that. Yeah. Don't take her away to her dreams. Right. <laughs> So I'm, a, right, so I'm a cell and molecular biologist, uh, cancer biologist by training, um, trained to work with uh, ovarian cancer. So still some women's, uh, mm. women's issues there. Um, and still do work in intellectual property some. Um, however, uh, we did launch four years ago, really as a way, I mean, you can't turn on the television, open a newspaper or web browser without hearing something about millennials. Everything from, you know, unemployment rates to who did we vote for, how do you get us more involved in, the civic, uh, in, in civic engagement. And what we found was that while a lot of that conversation was coming from commentators and pollsters outside the generation, we didn't see quite as much dialogue coming from the generation itself. Um, and so I, I think one of the things that I it sort of as the conversation was going on and we sort of veered towards the Women's March and I guess one of the questions I have for you, Steve, you started the conversation by saying that you consider yourself an ally. What, what does that mean for you? Oh. <laughs> I love it. Oh, sorry. Turn it around. No, I mean, I, I, I tell you, you know, I, mean, I, I, I suppose that for me, I have a very hard time with discrimination or bigotry of any kind, whether it's women, whether it's gays, whether it's the color of your skin, where it may come from, whether it's your socioeconomic class. It's something that burns. I was grazed as an Air Force brat on military bases, which was kind of a 
you know, a, a, a mixing pot of a lot of different people. When I left that environment after growing, I, I remember experiencing the first racism I'd ever seen, or the first bigotry. The, the, yeah, there was a misogyny that was built into the military that I saw and witnessed for a long time. So I guess as an ally, I feel as if um, uh, someone who, who is as worried as any woman I know about those injustices that are built in. That said, I'm a Nixonian realist, and I have a bit of a difference from a lot of my friends that I would say are in the global justice community, which is I want to know what the playbook is to win. Mm -hmm. What do you do? There's a lot of heart out there. I want to know what the hard choices are, where you get a bank shot that wins, that, that helps move you forward. Because I know a lot of people who are sentimentally, emotionally concerned with moving the needles forward, but they don't necessarily know. Richard Holbrook taught me this. Richard Holbrook would deal with the devil. I used to call him the Democrats realist because he would do things to sort of deal with HIV in Africa or deal with you know, injustice, but he had to deal with the worst people in the world to do there. So that's kind of where I'm at. So I'm an, a concerned with strategy. Okay. Um, so I guess my next question for you. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, okay, and I'm, no. I'm going somewhere with yeah. this. So you mentioned, you know, you sort of, um, you know, kind of did a comparison between what we've seen this weekend um, and throughout the last couple of months with Colin Kaepernick and the NFL and taking a knee and that whole conversation. Right. Um, and then sort of contrasted that with the Women's March. So I think the Women's March was great. I think the turnout was phenomenal. I think it was very much needed, um, right. at, at least for me, very therapeutic. Um, but I think that one of the conversations that got lost, um, and I think I was probably more aware of it, um, and I think in tune with it, one, being a, a young black woman, um, and, and, and just kind of seeing what the undercurrent was and, and sort of what the conversation was on black Twitter, um, on black social media channels, is that there had been a lack of intersectionality in some of these movements before then. And so did even, you feel that on the Women's March too? Um, and it was specifically about the Women's March. There was a lot of discontent and, and dissatisfaction, I think, with, from a lot of black women who have been on the forefront on the forefront of, you know, trying to push the needle, as you say, that, you know, where were all of these women when it came, you know, when, when we had issues with Mike Brown, um, with Alton Sterling, where were all of these crowds and people taking to the street when the issues were wider, when they affected African Americans? So I think for us, I think that it, it very much needed, but there was also this sense that now you're showing up. Mm -hmm. Where have you been? And so I think it sort of made me think of that when you sort of, you know, sort of did the comparison between the Women's March and what we've seen on well, the Well, as for the, the, the strategy on taking the knee, it'd be interesting this other things. I found, I found this movement an effective way to educate and teach a lot of folks who have not thought about mass or, or, or over-incarceration of black Americans, what's happened, you know, the kind of, bi you know, many of the biases that ta Coates has been mm -hmm. raising and writing about in the Atlantic. And I found that, wow, every week this has been going on and building and building and building, and it's pushing a nerve, it's pushing a nerve, it's pushing a nerve, and it's really making people think and comment. And I sort of wish, honestly, and, and, and maybe where my thoroughfares aren't there, and I'd be interested in where, is that even though 22,000 women have shown a fellow hunter, people, maybe in my world, aren't feeling that nerve enough from that women's march in an ongoing way, unless I call Susanna or Susanna's in a program with me, then I feel that, <laughs> that nerve. But, but I, you know, I think that there's something about the tactics of, of building awareness and the tactics of, of um, change it can't that be make polite. things uncomfortable. It can't be polite. It yeah. has to be uncomfortable. I think to push the needle of the conversation has to be uncomfortable, and that's what we're seeing. I was very uncomfortable all weekend long. I think, one, being a part of the dialogue, but also having to listen to it, see it, and seeing people really not understand what, what Colin Kaepernick, what it, you know, it kind of began to take a different conversation. This is anti-Trump. This is anti-Republican, anti-GOP, or anti-flag, or anti-patriotic, and it was not of those things. It was to raise the conversation about right. brutality against African Americans. And some sort of way the conversation is just sort of shifted to give certain other conversations cover instead of mm. beginning to focus on what the original But I think that's was. actually a strategy. Do you have any other questions I, I think, for Maria actually, Therese? No, I actually think, that's <laughs> but I, actually, I think that, that that is a strategy of the right to actually water down Absolutely. what the bending of the knee is. Because Absolutely. most folks, even in their coverage, failed to, re to acknowledge that he was taking the knee under the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so, yeah. we, so it's, it's, it's our, and so our job is to make sure that, mm -hmm. uh, is making sure that there's always a testament. I, I have to say that Ship from Fox, he, uh, 
Shep, Shep, what's his first name? Oh, Shepard. Shepard Shep, Shep, Smith. Thank you, Shepard. Shep, Shep, Shep. <laughs> uh, Shepard Smith really like, the, engaged with a reporter who was trying to connect it to the national anthem and to the fog. And he's like, no, no. We are complicit by not correcting the narrative. And I think mm. that is the job of everyone, and no longer just the media, but of fellow citizens, of making Absolutely. sure that we are testament to that. And I do think that while there's a lot of rumblings around the Women's March, I think that it also gave people a different type of courage. Um, oftentimes, generations have heard of the 1960s and people marching and coming out, and there was all of a sudden not only nostalgia, but a memory of what that means to be an active citizen. And the only reason we are having the fourth repeal of recent memory of the healthcare debate was because Americans took to town halls and called the members of Congress, and all of a sudden they found courage to give their members of Congress mm -hmm. courage. So I think that people have not forgotten the lessons most recently of the women's rights, but it's happening at the local level. But how do we take those, that outrage of trying to take something personal for me from healthcare mm -hmm. to everything else, yeah. and recognizing that this is actually what we are living right now is a defining moment of where our path is going to be for the future of, the, of this country. And that is the challenge, can, like how do we borrow those? Can I ask you, you know, we're, we're living in complex political times, and, and, and what I'm interested in, all of you have been in, in various uh, civil rights movements, women's rights movements, uh, Hispanic rights, and-, and, and broad, Civil rights. Civil yes. rights, <laughs> broad civil rights agenda. And, and one of the questions I have is, is how, what are the best strategies for engaging folks who are not your allies, who are not fellow travelers, who are not in that bubble, who do not, you know, one, we're, one of the things that we see is that if you, if you buy a book on Amazon, uh, we'll be able to predict the next 20 you'll buy. And, 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 yeah. and we live in bubbles. Uh, uh, yeah. Eli Pariser called it the filter bubble. And so the question is, how do we reach or how do you reach effectively people who may not have encountered? That's one other thing that come to the Carlos Kaepernick mm -hmm. protest. I think they're reaching people who would yeah. never, otherwise have never uh, and kind of this, I think Dale Earnhardt's tweet yesterday was yeah. extraordinary moment for those people in race car yeah. driving of bringing something and penetrating. So I'm just wondering, you know, tricks of the trade in mm. terms of reaching beyond your own people who fellow, I mean, I, I don't know for sure, but I imagine pretty much everybody in this room, you know, has a pretty shared vision of what they'd like to do. But what about the people over at the stadium over here one night who may not be in fact in this? How do you, how do you reach out beyond your bubble? I'll, I'll just, yeah. I'll, I'll go from here. Um, so I think that one of the techniques that, you know, I, one of the questions that we sort of talked about backstage was, you know, are you partisan, are you nonpartisan? Very much partisan. <laughs> but the organization that we run, because of the nature of what we're trying to do, which is have those difficult conversations and hopefully in the process create, create a platform, but also change some ideas, hopefully. Mm. Um, but you can't just do that by sort of stacking the panel with all people who believe or kind of see the world a certain way. Um, so I think for us, it, it just really starts, um, you know, for, for me and kind of curating the content that we use to, to reach millennials, to reach mm. young people, um, is to go across the board. You know, we have folks on the left, folks on the right, some in the middle, many of which I don't always agree with, um, but we still give them a voice. We still give them a platform. So is misogyny better or worse in millennials than the older generation? Oh, <laughs> wow. I hope it's better. That's oh a, gosh, that's a, I mean, I, I don't think that's going to be something that you ever... Uh, for lack of a better word, cure um, or overcome. Um, but I think yeah. that you don't think it can be cured because I mean I I love that you were asking Steve yeah. you know, why are you an ally because I really think that the missing piece to a lot of the work that all of us do is talking to the men about not just to, you know. Men don't need so much empowerment, as you guys might know, but but talking to them about <laughs> why it's so important. To awareness empower is women. empowerment. That's yeah. awareness is empowerment. Yeah, and, and really, but it's it's funny. I mean, one of the things my um, best moment this fall is my boys who are teenagers signed up for a women and gender studies class at their high school. So we've been having all of these amazing yeah. conversations about it, and even though they grew up with me as a mother. Who, they've been very indoctrinated. They still, <laughs> they come home every day and they're like, did you know this? I'm like, uh, yeah, I actually yeah. did know that. <laughs> but I don't think that most boys take women and gender studies classes. I don't mm. think that, that right. we talk yeah. to men about how a more um, equal society is actually better for everybody. And I really do think that's the missing piece. So somebody needs to start a group to start educating um, men yeah. about about this. I, I think yeah, that's I right. think I, I mean I no. think it's gotten a lot better in in 20 years. You know, I I had my sort of uh, 
the moment that so many young women had around the Women's March, you know, their first like, wow, this is a thing and I'm part of it, you know. I had that experience 20 some years ago when I was 21 years old at the Beijing Women's Conference and hearing Hillary, you know, right. say women's rights are human rights and just being surrounded by all these activists and learning about these issues that nobody knew about. And what's interesting to me is that, you know, in that 20 years, I mean, we didn't have the kind of tools we needed to engage men, quite frankly, because we were talking in the language of rights. You know, well, you know, it's only fair. We're 20, you know, 51% of the population. But now, you know, we've got the research and the data that says investing in women, supporting women to, you know, start companies, to go to school, to have their rights protected, actually, that's smart business sense. I mean, to the tune of, 28 trillion dollars we could add to global GDP if women were empowered economically to start businesses, be part of the, the labor force. So, you know, we have that, and I have found that that really works. I mean, once we had the data, we could really talk to men and engage them in a way that wasn't emotional. It was just like, here are the facts. The facts make sense. Mm -hmm. But I think right. we, should, we could also take a model out of the, the Swedish school system. They actually teach gender parity and equality at the grade school okay. level from the um, very beginning when they are in, in preschool and bring, and bring them up. And that is actually how we start changing culture and behavior. Yeah. That when well, it's it's yeah. not a second afterthought. So there yeah, are right. models that we could implement, but oftentimes we, we find ourselves only looking internally in this country and not looking at places and, you know, taking other people's playbook. I mean, people take our playbooks all the time. We I mean, attitudes, I mean, I, I've been <laughs> following for years the attitudes on same-sex marriage, and there's just no doubt that the next generation has attitudes towards same-sex marriage that are very, very different yeah. than, than the elder generation, yeah. who are finally kind of acquiescing, but, you know, it's just a not issue, but it's just one of these things which is so baked into our society. That's why I ask about millennials, because right. maybe there's a way that will just die out of this and solved. But what you're saying is you don't think that, 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 that you know, this kind of misogyny, the kind of uh, anti women is something that's going to require work for a long time, that 20 years from now you're I, still going to... But I actually think that the, policy, the politics of economics is actually one of the reasons why you're seeing increased gender parity, right? Yep. Millennials don't have the luxury of deciding if a partner is going to stay at home or not. This yeah. idea that, right. they, that, that that is even an option is very rare. So I think this idea of both folks going into the workforce also neutralizes this idea of who's necessarily better. Mm -hmm. And one of the pieces that I think that and I think it, gets, it brought, brought us into this era, is that a lot of men during, that were part of the construction industry, and so on and so forth, after the 2008 collapse, they haven't been able to retool to their previous jobs. And so now they're going to have to rethink what, is it, what does it mean to be, take on a different type of job, such as in the healthcare industry, where all of a sudden I could be a male nurse, right? So I think those, yeah. those types of what are the jobs that are available, but also this idea of who's in the workforce Absolutely. is also going to shape gender. I, I want to go to the audience for comments, questions, thoughts. I'm going to tell you lightning round, super fast, uh, no life stories today because we won't have time. But Suzanne, <laughs> before we do that, Cleveland, you were in Cleveland with us. Yeah. Uh, we did uh, events, with, we worked with um, Susanna both in Cleveland and in um, Philadelphia for the different conventions. And I love that program we did in Cleveland and I thought it was really inspiring. We had great, um, mainly GOP uh, women leaders who come in. How is the enthusiasm gap for running among uh, the GOP side of things compared to the Democratic side of things? Oh, I mean, you know the answer. It, it, um, I don't know. <laughs> well, well, I mean, look at Congress. I mean, uh. th there are um, two-thirds of the women in Congress are Democrats, and I actually think it might be even a little bit less or Republicans. They haven't really seen gains um, ever, huge gains. Mm. And uh, it's one of the big things that we work on. So I think that, that it is... That is a piece of the puzzle. We have to figure out how to make politics um, attractive to, the re um, to Republican women, because I think that we have to get more Republican women into politics. I, Mitch McConnell said that he had a problem, right? So when he was he? trying, well, when he was talking to the governor of Alabama of who he was going to replace Sessions with, he uh. actively asked for a female candidate, mm. and that's not who they put up. Yeah. And he li he was quoted as saying, "Is that the GOP has a." old white male problem, I need your help. I don't think he'll ever say that out loud, but he's, you know, a reporter caught him, it was, on, it was on record, and so I think that that is where they have to retool. I do think, though, that there is, uh, there has to be, they have to start changing uh, policies that are much more inclusive of basic female needs. Natalie and Elise, in your, in your membership, when you think about pipelines for political activism, are you, among the millennial crowd, are you 
Do you, do, you, do you sort of see a new crowd coming in, willing to kind of get in the grime and grit of all of this? Absolutely. Yeah, I do. I, and I see it around the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think, you know, a lot of young businesswomen who are like, well, I could do a better job, you know, in Africa, in, you know, in the Middle East. I mean, really, there, there, there is this growing fervor around the world with women, particularly young women, saying, I want to be part of positive change. Natalie, I just want to tell you, I want to be a uh, millennial ally. Too. Uh, <laughs> All right, I'll I'm a millennial <laughs> wannabe. Uh, let's, we have a microphone, let's go ahead and write down here. Real short. Um, real short. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> real brief. She's going to hold the mic. I'm Mitzi Wertheim. I want to add a different dimension to this. I have a ninth grader at Berkeley High School, and she was here in April, and I took her to hear Madeleine Albright. She didn't understand a word Madeleine Albright talked about, because Madeleine talked about coming in as an immigrant and having to fight her way up. Her great-grandmother worked, her grandmother works, her mother worked. She didn't understand the problems that we've had because it hasn't been discussed the way the civil rights movement was. So the question, Mitzi? Well, how do we start getting stories question. out that everybody can understand how hard this has been and how important it is on all age levels. Thoughts? Getting the story out. I mean, look, I think the best thing to do is to, to bring some of the younger women in leadership. It doesn't just have to be politics. And have them talk to the younger generation. This is actually something that Running Start does in colleges around the country. We bring um, young elected officials. Because there's no better role model. I mean, Madeline Albright, I love dearly. But she's not as accessible to that ninth grade student. And if you bring in somebody who's a 22-year-old state legislator, wow. I mean, that is mm. so exciting because she can see that path. Right here in the back. Yes, hi. Hi, Ali Arbella with Ernst & Young. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm a newly promoted manager at my firm, and so I get to spend a lot of my time now coaching some of the younger staff, and it is quite a joy. Uh, I find that some of the younger women often ask me how to get over situations where they feel intimidated in the workplace. And so being very successful, what are some of the tools from your belt that you would use to recommend to them how to overcome? And before you answer, I just want to call out Ernst & Young, and I, I love all accounting firms, but uh, uh, <laughs> Ernst & Young did a fascinating study that Beth Brook there had put together yeah. that looked at the fact that um, corporate boards with women on them performed better, that there was a, there was a financial return and benefit uh, for those firms that had diverse, inclusive boards versus those that didn't. And I just want to say, put that on the notes for people there. But um, thoughts on, yeah. on, on also, you know, how do you overcome that? I love Ernst Young, too, because Beth Brook <laughs> is the new chair of my board, and I could oh. be happier. Um, and Exxon Mobil saying, how can we get that? I, <laughs> I love Exxon Mobil. There you, there you go. You just, just plugged on <laughs> Um, well, I honestly, I feel like I um, was really lucky to have some great women mentors um, and also just an incredible group of peers, mm -hmm. peer mentors yeah. like Susanna, yeah. who's always been so supportive of me. And vice um, versa, yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I honestly, I think to feel emboldened as a young person, that's really important to have that sort of kitchen cabinet um, of mentors, but also don't go up to someone and say, hey, you know, um, I'd like you to be my mentor. You have to show them who you are and, you know, so that they want to get behind you. Susanna wrote an op-ed, if I may speak for you. Um, yeah, you can. It was a great op-ed on, on bias, but you, you basically took Hillary Clinton to task uh, for her book in which she said she chose not to oh. challenge Trump on the stage. And you said that many women are subjected to those intimidation tactics and they bite their lip and they just take it when, in fact, the answer is to just respond back at that moment. Okay. So am I, I, am I taking your content? Can I just yeah. clarify like a tiny bit? I took her to task, but I took myself to task too and yes. said, you know, we don't do it. And if we're not standing up for our rights and saying this is wrong, it's never going to change. I thought it was a lovely op-ed, though. Thank it was you. very honest. So, uh, yes, right here in the middle. She's oh, never going to let you. you have the mic. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm Dr. Ronnie Lowenstein, 15 years on the Hill, 52 years as an educator using technology for change, Global Connections Exchange Africa mm -hmm. State Department. You've talked about a lot of things. You've talked about a variety of issues that highlight living in the liminal moment where old structures have broken down. We don't have new ones. I love everything that everyone is doing individually. Changing culture is going to have to be with youth. They are our future. And the, the cyber nation that we're living in right. was written about 
uh, um, by Martin Luther King in 1968, science and technology, right. et cetera. What can we do to civically engage youth and link them to the real world, which is what I do with Global Net Generation okay. of Youth, cyber <laughs> journalists. It's a little bit of a commercial them? there, but that's right. okay. But, but this has been a passion yeah. and, and so forth. So what, can, what are you doing, what can we do collectively to engage the youth and, ha and harness their power to tell the stories? Natalie, let me start with you. Um, you know, simply put, I, I think it kind of goes to the foundation of, of why we launched Millennial Week, which really give millennials or young mm. people a platform and a voice. What we're doing right now is sort of talking about the generation again. Um, what we tend to do is, you know, we've had town halls literally with, with 600 plus young people just in the crowd, getting them on stage, sure. opening up the floor to just hear their concerns. Um, sometimes we have leaders that are outside the generation. We always try to find um, you know, politicians that are a little bit younger, but just sometimes it's just really giving a voice and a platform to say, what do you think about this? What right. are your concerns? And then just really starting there. Final thought, uh -huh. Susanna? I was just gonna say, nobody asked them. You're, you're absolutely right, nobody's asking the millennials, so you know, what should we be doing and how is this affecting your life? So I, I, love, I love the word. So we ask all the time, uh, that's actually <laughs> who our group is. We actually focus on young you poll, people. You right? Yeah. Uh, you poll them. <laughs> We, no, but we also register them. We actually, we're, so we're a civic media organization, so we'll partner with, for, for, for example, we've partnered with Hulu and actually integrated story characters in some of their series. We, all our work is engaging them. So we recently developed an app last year called VoterPal, and literally, trying to register as many voters, we recognize that the best way to do it is to get it out of our belly and into their hands. And so it's a peer-to-peer -peer app, and we teach them how to register each other, but to have conversations. We'll partner with Planned Parenthood to talk about issues about health. And the idea is like, the more informed they are, the more stories we tell them, the more the story that they're the storytellers telling their peers, the stronger they are. And it is so cool. You, years ago, was it Steve Alfaro was <laughs> still with you? Yes, he gave he you this thing, and you know, I was already registered to vote, unfortunately, <laughs> but if I could get in and basically download a lot of music for free, too. So, yeah, we, so we partnered. Music so, this was before I, anybody did my could vote do to it. Latino card. That's right. We got, so, we had partnered with iTunes, yeah. and we basically, if, if uh, and you would basically, in, to volunteer, we would give you 25 free songs, but we d distributed it to radio DJs around the country. So, right. we were in 25 markets doing it. And the idea was that we are trying to meet them where they are. 60% of Latinos are under the age of 33. Mm. Wow. The mean age of Latinos is 16 to 17 years old. So we're, we need a tsunami of infrastructure that needs to be built to meet the need. By comparison, our white counterparts is the median, the median age, the mean age is 56 years old. So it's wow. close to 25 years and it also explains how we voted in different ways. Elise? So. Final yeah. Thoughts. Well, I just say in terms of young people yeah. and engaging them, I mean, obviously we can't afford not to. And, and especially right. as we look around the world, I mean, the youth population is rising, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I think we've certainly found that in our work. But honestly, for me, anytime I, I can, um, I, wherever I go and speak, I'll always go to a high school in that community to just talk to the young people. Mm. And there's, you know, quite frankly, um, there's, I think there's some challenges there with what's going on in our government mm -hmm. right now, where a lot of these voices of, of bullies have been more emboldened. I'll also say scary. that, <laughs> um, just, just to wrap this up, that, that um, before we did Ideas Forum, which I hope all of you will come to in the next couple of days, we went out to a number of youth engagement organizations and opened the doors gratis. So you'll see a lot of millennials and younger uh, yeah. that are coming to the Ideas uh, forum. So, um, I guess, Natalie, I was going to give you the last question, but oh, we're out of time. <laughs> uh, uh, I want to thank oh, well. Susanna Welford, Nat Natalie Moss, <laughs> Teresa Kamara, and Elise thank Nelson. You. Thank you very, very much thank for you, a wonderful conversation. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you.